we've got about four or five things popping off weirdly and wrongly as we dive into this, but you know how it goes. Hey, it's Thursday, and how do I sound, chat? Hopefully I sound great. Tell me what you think. I hear Troy and some music. Great. Fantastic. So we have got... uh, quite a program today. Um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is, uh, yes, yeah, streaming do be like that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, we've got, of course, a special guest. You may know him as Sword Papa, but we call him Malcolm Shepard. Hi, buddy. Howdy. Look, I have you in the wrong format. But, you know, we are talking about Lair of the Horn Giant today. And uh, this mm-hmm. is, uh, it, tell me a little bit about it. A little bit about it. Well, um, yeah. this one was really, you know, it was a kind of age archaeology kind of thing. In that um, this adventure is actually, let's see, nine years old. Um, because again, it's 90 years old, nine, not okay, nine years old. Gotcha. Yes, yes. Uh, three threes, um, a great denial in German, nine years old. Um, (laughs) nice. So, (laughs) so basically, the story of this is that when the only age game was Dragon Age, um. Green Running uh, recognized that a lot of people were interested in uh, playing that game outside of the um, Dragon Age setting, as cool as the Dragon Age setting is. Yeah, and so um, and so the company produced. This was before my time. Um, so the company produced a number of uh, supplements to support that, and one of them never got published, and it was called the Horn Giant. And uh, and I found it uh, rummaging through uh, some of our files. So the so, yeah, we're real deep in the library of uh, yeah. of all of our titles. Yeah, mm-hmm. the dusty tomes, now, as it were. I didn't write it. Um, that was written and developed by uh, Will Hindmarch. Will Hindmarch was uh, you know uh, was Dragon Age developer, and he is a fantastic designer and developer um he's worked on a lot of stuff you've heard of and and now i think if i'm not like i haven't you know i haven't had a chat with will to coordinate our vibes or anything but uh as far as i know he's you know the creative lead of level leader games which is kind of a cool uh fundraising through gaming hi nice Kind of thing, right? Okay. Right. He's he's just a very thoughtful kind of guy, and I read this, and you know, and it was great. Um, and I thought, well, you know what, this would be great for. It would be great to turn into uh, an adventure for Fantasy Age Second Edition. So I went to work on that, and uh, it didn't require that much because you know, Age is such a Age's basic stuff is so robust that, you know, even though, you know, there are a different number of game statistics between the two games and a bunch of other changes, it didn't work out being that much work at all. Gotcha. Right? Because the bones of it were so good. It had already been written and, uh, you know, written and developed by Will and had it already been uh, edited by, by Chris Premis. So all I had to do was just add some extra stuff and get approved and so on. So and you're like an adventure toolkit rescuer. You know, you... <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. No, this has kind of a toolkit feel to it um, because it was very well designed um, by Will that way with the idea that basically what he did is the whole idea of the horn giant is that it's this Ur myth, right? That's based on, you know, you know, that has reflections in Greek mythology, um, you know, uh, Greek mythology, Indo-Persian mythology. Sure. You know, Roman mythology. So a lot of, you know, Mediterranean Near East mythology. And that's kind of what we focus on in an archetypal way so that you can customize it for your particular campaign. 
That's fantastic. Right. So, hey, real quick, before we go on, I want to say hi to folks in chat. Uh, good to see you, friends. I'm looking at, oh, yep, Rain's here. We've got uh, Duke is here. Steve is here. Uh, let me know, friends. I, I'm hearing uh, or reading that there's um, a download. Maybe you haven't gotten your email yet from uh, from your order. Let me know. And uh, Bad Devil's here. Good to see you, friend. Mm -hmm. Brian F. Irving as well. Vaughn Cockles here. Good to see you. And uh, Nate Robbins, good to see you too. <laughs> Duke says nine. Um, fantastic. And uh, oh, Stormer says uh, happy birthday, little adventure. Yeah, we kind of kept a little adventure uh, in the uh, <laughs> in the attic for a while, but uh, dusted dusted off little adventure, and now we've got lots of stuff to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so, when uh, what is your what would you tell people to look at first? Is that kind of I mean, of course, read page to page. Look of at course, first, but, you know. Yeah. Um, it's got, you know, the way it's kind of set up is that instead of being like, here, here's the thing, right? This kicks off something called Fantasy Age Dungeons, which is basically we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be doing adventures for Fantasy Age that are around this size, um, being released in electronic formats, uh, just to provide okay. continuous support, right? So this is kind of our name for that series, but they're not always going to be literal dungeons. And weirdly, the way things worked out, the first one is not a literal dungeon. So the way this works is that we have a um, basically a scenario where uh, we have a couple of mythic figures and we have the story of a cult, right? Uh, okay. That surrounds these mythic figures. But how exactly you place them and what you do with them is like there's strong guidance but it is left to the game master uh some of you might remember fantasy age layers and you know i actually added the term layer of because i thought originally you know before i became developer what we might do with this is make a like a bonus fantasy age layer well, for thing. those of you for those of you who aren't familiar didn't check out our last episode um uh malcolm and ian have swapped you, you've exchanged That's right. Games. I'm Fantasy yeah. Age developer now, and he's Cthulhu Awakens developer. Nice, nice. Oh. A lot of compliments for uh, Fantasy Age layers. And uh, I sound slightly over. Oh, that's a great book. It's one of my favorite <laughs> Fantasy Age books. It is my favorite nice. Fantasy Age book, I think. Um, you know, like, shout out to, uh, to Jack Norris for getting that together during his tenure on the game. Yeah, um, you know the games pass through a lot, a lot of hands, and uh, and I'm happy to wreck it now. No, um, <laughs> you know, uh, put my particular imprint on it, right? Nice. So it's not going to be a surprise because if you, you know, you've had a chance to see my work because you know I've contributed, you know, I've developed two other games for the company now. So there you go. But so bad. Uh, no, sorry. My, my audio just blew my ears out. Um, uh, bad devil says it's giving off tomb of the Seeress energy. Does that ring a bell? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and nice. yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Um, the idea is that, uh, we, we just want to have this out, you know, so that you have something to do, you know, so that people have something to run. Now this is a higher level adventure in this case. Um, okay. so, it's weird to start with this, but it's what we had on hand. And also, you know, we have made a lot of introductory adventures for a lot of games, right? Uh, so, you know, keep in mind there are age versions of, you know, there, you know, there are a couple of there are a couple of low level age adventures out there from yeah. the one in the core book to uh, Death in Freeport. Uh, I'm not sure how much of the other Freeport adventures got converted. See, I'm not sure either. Thing. Yeah, this is the thing. I am learning as I come in because previously a lot of these things were peripheral to me. Yeah. So, so I'm kind of chasing them down now, and that's kind of part of of that kind of switch. You know, that's great. Um, Ian was great at preparing me for everything, right? And you know, we shared a bunch of stuff, but you know, there's. Sometimes there's just stuff you gotta figure out yourself. Especially well, there's a different there's there's a different mindset when you are uh, maybe assisting with something or writing a little bit for something, but when you're actually then now the brain of it and you're tracking all of the various bits and pieces of it, that's a different context. Um, real, well, hey, real quick, I want to say, go ahead, but please. 
right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm reaching an age now where I, I have to prioritize what my brain retains. You know? Same. <laughs> so, you know, so this is the kind of style of a developer who's, you know, um, falling into senescence. So you got that figured out. No, um, <laughs> in, in all seriousness, though, uh, as I kind of get a handle on it, it, you know, it gives me a sense of, of where I want to go with the line. Right. Right. Like right now I am working on the, um, the revive, you know, what was fantasy age bestiary, um, or rather is kind of the successor to it. It was through a lot of things. Um, we have a tentative title for it now that is different than the last three tentative titles we had, but it is tentative, so I'm not going to tell you. But I am, you know, while I'm, while I am, you know, polishing and talking about Lair of the Horn Giant, uh, there's also this book, uh, this Fantasy Age Adversaries book that I'm working on, and also there are two um, two supplements about the length of Trojan War that are written fantastic some and people were just asking just, about that yeah yes yes so i don't know if i should say what they should i say what they are troy you're the expert i don't, on. I don't think so and partially because we like to keep everybody in sort of a constant state of a aggravation um so the knowing i think is is a nice uh sort of amuse bouche to the uh to the you know <laughs> so um, we will uh release it someday but not today haha <laughs> Um, hey, real quick, I just want to say a couple things um, before we before we dive in to uh, the Esoterica. Um, you can pick this up at Roll Twenty for seven dollars ninety nine cents. They so we have got the VTT team have we have the cards um, in there. Let me actually I'm going to swap something here so that we can all peruse it together. And oh my, yeah, this best is the thing. I'm not plans. a VTT guy, but every time Jonesy shows me something that he's doing, I yeah, am. Yeah. You know, I'm fairly blown away. Like, yeah. for Cthulhu Awakens, he came up with this graphical thing for um, for advanced tests and challenge tests. Yeah, that looks like cool and and genre appropriate, even right. And some of the things they can do with maps these days. Oh, you crazy kids with your computers! <laughs> Thank you, Vaughn. I'm just love that. Um, hang on one second. I'm getting, I'm pulling, uh, I want to, I, because I'm with you on that, there's some great stuff and adding some of the, I think it's like when you're looking at what a product is, um, mm -hmm. and then you, uh, want to, you know, sort of plus it by adding it through roll 20, which has some, uh, you know, uh, some things that you have to consider. Mm -hmm. Um, hang on one second. And I'm going to show you one of those things right now. Window. There we go. How's that looking? All right, sure. I like it. Why not? Um, I just wanted to share uh, the the magic deck. Um, there are some. Uh, is this a general fantasy age thing that uh, Jonesy did, or is it for this adventure? This, this is for this adventure. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Yeah, one of the yeah. things in this adventure is that we have a lot of flexibility. So we have treasure tables, right? And Ooh, um, Yeah, tell us more. Yeah, and Jonesy had this great idea that you could replace the table with a kind of deck interface. Um, so this is what it is, right? This is nice. This is the first time I've seen it, actually. Yeah, and uh, the cards are great. Um, uh, I'm pulling them up. I see what's happening here. Let me do this instead. Okay, great. You know, I opened it up and then it stopped you know, performing as I demand. Here we go. One more time. And. Uh, okay, great. Well, here's uh, some of the tokens. Oh, yeah. And then you, you see the right map on. in the background. There's a labyrinth map inside. Um, mm -hmm. And then let's jump to. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I have to go through all of my. All of my junk here. Um there we go. Here is the deck. Um, so, basically, it's these are magical items, right? I mean, yeah. Is that yeah? Yeah. There's a, for, there are a couple there are a couple of new magic items in there, right? 
couple nice. of magic items, um, one, two, three, like four new adversaries. And, yeah, uh, for new, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's some new maps, uh, and there's maps I believe that are exclusive to World Twenty. Are there? Ooh, wow. I believe so. I mean, I think. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Um, let's see. Should I bought the World Twenty for this extra stuff? You know, I'm going to find out for sure. I mean, my understanding is that that is the case, but also, um, you know, maybe I'm full of it. But mm. uh, but I'll I'll find out here in just one second. Um, and uh, but yeah, so yeah, Jonesy is very passionate, uh, great uh, contributor to the whole, uh, you know, VTT thing that we're yeah. pulling off. And uh, yeah, we're 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 quite committed to VTT stuff, and we're looking forward to all the future sort of expansions and things before someone asks. Um, but here's a question. Is the horn giant going to be available for print on demand? Says uh, I don't think the, I don't think the length justifies it. Okay. Yeah. 13 pages, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, so if it was potted, it would go up to 16 and, you know, we could Add throw some, some random crap in the back of it, uh, but you know, I think okay. uh, it's better off just electronic. Understood. Understood. Saying we can't um, collect them at some point, though, right? Which we've done with adventures yeah. in the past. Like, um, you know, here's where I'm going to boost one of my my pet projects. Oh, if please you, do. For those of you who are threefold aficionados, um, we did do the Five and Infinity Adventure series, right? And we released yeah. them as individual adventures, but then we gathered them together and along with a couple of useful appendices um, about sort of adventure and world generation. Uh, and, uh, and we released that as a pod release, right? I'm quite proud yeah. of that one, actually, you know, I know we've got this adventure in front of us, but you know, why don't I just talk your ear off about these adventures that are several years old for a completely Listen. <laughs> Listen, my uh, friend, we are, we'll follow you wherever <laughs> you take us, wherever you take us. Um, oh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there are some great adventures in there. Like uh, it's what I was reading. I was reading the one uh, Crystal wrote um, when she was with us. Oh, and it's so good, right? It's like a, it's a casino in hell where you're trying to, to sort of, you're trying to gamble to save someone's soul. Right. Ooh, and okay. there are weird metaphysical laws on the plane where like, you know, um, you have a golden shackle that reveals your, your debts and, oh, it's just got some cool, weird stuff. And, uh, anyway, layer the horn giant, right, Troy? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, hey, I think that's great. But, you know, here's the thing, Malcolm. People love yes. to hear this stuff. Now, we'll get there. Okay. People know that there's there's a, a QR code on the screen if you're looking for uh, – you can pick that up from the Green Running Online store. And of course, yeah. we're selling it at mm -hmm. Drive Through RPG as well. And then the Roll20. And the Roll20 is a little more expensive because it's got some extra goods, mm -hmm. which uh, which you should love. And, and uh, we have more coming, right? Like Fantasy Age Dungeons is a series. So the next one is probably going to be an adventure by uh, Steve Kenson. The Steve Kenson? The very same. Wow. That's great. The very same. Um, We're fans of Steve Kenson around this joint. Yes. Yes. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so here's a, here's a question real quick. It says, um, the Temple asks, I'm betting Lair of the Horn Giant will be a twist on the hero going into the Lair of the Beast to slay it. Well, here's the thing. There are actually a couple of different options that are explored there where you might be rescuing the Horn you might be rescuing, you know, the the great bull of the sun. By the way, the the thing on the cover is not the horn giant. Oh, surprise, surprise! Wow. It's big and what? horned. Yeah, it's, it's got horns and it's big. Not uh, the okay. Basically, it, it, a lot of it depends on where you put the cult in your campaign and and how exactly you customize that legend, right? Okay. Now you can pick up and run this in kind of an impressionist fashion, but it's it's, it's really cousin. kind of designed. <laughs> So that you can drop it frictionlessly into your campaign because you can tweak all the elements you want. One regret that I have post hoc is that um, is that I I kind of wish that we had connected it to Trojan War somehow. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you're running a Fantasy Age Trojan War campaign, this is a great 
supplement for it. Like you can go with all Greek mythology and you won't have to change anything. Like you might have to make some of the weapons do less damage because they'll be made of bronze. And, gotcha. and, and that's it. Right. And we have guidelines for that in Trojan War, man. So, you know, those two go very well together. Well, that's what, what I like about this. Yeah. Troy? I think that's real nice, real smart <laughs> as well. Um, yes. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, yeah, because you basically, you you know, we've got a table that will change up who the horn giant is yeah. or the, the feature and function of them. I don't know if we want to do you, I always get worried about sharing too much deep detail because yeah, there's some spoilery spoil stuff. Today. Yeah. But basically wanna, yeah. this thing this thing kind of takes a whole bunch of stuff, you know, it takes stuff from Greek mythology, it takes stuff from, you know, uh archaeology about Crete, it takes stuff from Mithraism, um, both uh you know, both sort of the Persian Mithraism and its evolution into uh the Roman cult. It's uh Here's the thing. In describing it, I have two challenges. The first is that I don't want to spoil too much. Yeah. Right. The second is, is that Will did such a great uh, a job structuring it for customization without you having to work at it. Yeah. That's what I like about right? that. Yeah. Steve, my <laughs> annoying cat, Tibble agrees. That scared the, the snot out of me. <laughs> I was like, do I have a giant cat? Am I in the giant yeah, cat's lair? I, Timmy, he's, he's <laughs> crouching behind my laptop, staring at me. Hold Timmy on. likes to. Timmy's taking a taking uh, an interest in the, <laughs> Timmy's taking an interest in the live streaming. <laughs> this is going to be a new new feature. Yes, on the Timmy stream right here. Um. So, no worries. Uh, the lair of the claw giant. Yeah, exactly. Just it was <laughs> it, it was so great. It was just like totally in my ear, right into the mic. Well, here's here's <laughs> the thing. In uh, in news totally unrelated to yeah. anything your audience might be interested in. Um, yes, my my poor cat Tybalt had to go in for surgery to get bladder stones removed, and now he's oh, on yikes. a special diet for the rest of his life. And that I'm sure he loves at first bite. Out food and yes, yes, he is. Uh, <laughs> Yes, he is kind of grouchy now. He is not quite used to the fact that he is yeah. not grazing <laughs> Lair of the mega on the yeah. plains. Yeah, um, no worries. Well, here's the thing. Tibby's always welcome on the program, so oh, no yes. no complaints here. Uh, I love that Lair of the Purring Persian. This is great stuff. Um, <laughs> so there was a question. If you want to adapt this to Dragon Age, or Temple mentions this, and, and I'm sure you know we can... Uh, you know, and I, I, I mentioned this in the context of there are some other connections and things that we can you can utilize this in. And we we mentioned outright that it's very easy to couple with other age games yes. and, you know, use it. to. So let's let's talk about that real quick. But Tempo says, if you want to adapt this to Dragon Age, it could be an ancient ogre from the first blight uh, and a cult that worships oh, yeah. arch demons and darkspawn. Yeah. It, oh, yeah, it definitely could be. Um, you know, there are a lot of options for for what it might be in Blue Rose, right? Um, oh, what is the name of the island civilization called? I'm, this oh, is it's, what I, uh, is it Lartia? Oh, gosh. Uh, I would have to look Come it up. Chattel, Chattel, no. Chattel, no. Chattel, no. Um, Pobregato. I like that. Yeah. But, you know, certainly because of the kind of Mediterranean element of it, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah. where I would that's where I would situate it. Uh, I uh, you know generally speaking, uh, when I need facts uh, and sh and Rain shares some stuff, then I know mm -hmm. it's probably right. And he, uh, th they are saying you have it right. The uh, the island, um, yeah, civilization. Yeah, the what did you call them? The it's Lartia. The Slatia. Yeah, I Lartia, A L A R T Y A, yeah. and there's an apostrophe in there. Lartia, Ooh. or is it Lartia? Lartia, Lartia. How do you pronounce that? I don't know. Um, and it's our L A R. Want to get Steve on the horn real quick? Or? Yeah, yeah. Let me let me send it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> He'll know for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah the matriarchy of the Lartia. 
Larchia. There we go. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I could definitely see that as, you know, uh, as mythology about, um, about maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a chauvinistic cult that was driven from their culture. Right. Right. Or maybe it is, you know, may, like, well, one of the interesting things, of course, is you have like a seaborne matriarchy in Blue Rose, right? Yeah. Um, whereas the legend of the Minotaur, right, references Crete, and Crete was matriarchal, right? So one thing you could do this a couple of, you know, you could do this a couple of ways. And one of them would be just kind of like have a, um, a sort of, bias flipped set of cultures where there's like a patriarchal um, island of incels sure, bull yeah. worshiping bull worshiping culture the isle of incels uh, <laughs> <laughs> a patriarchal bull worshiping culture that is sort of at a distance from from the larchians right got it got maybe it. Yeah, they yeah. once existed and were driven away uh, maybe they're or maybe like kind of like you know the fact that we look at Crete through Greek mythology with a distorted lens, right? Maybe the player characters will get misinformed, right? Because, I see. You know, because their informants have, have this bias, right? Right. And maybe they're separated for a completely different reason. There's a lot of, a lot of directions you could go. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Um, so when you you mentioned Blue Rose real quick, um, I, you well, know, you could the, do it in Cthulhu Awakens as a Dreamlands thing too. Oh, that would be awesome. Oh, smart. Yeah, that would be super fun. You could play a you could play a crack crack squad of ghouls who are going to find and eat. <laughs> <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> we must eat the horn giant. You must eat the horn giant. I like that. Now, uh, okay, Tempo asks, would this involve rescuing a sea folk damsel in distress? It doesn't have to be a damsel. <laughs> you know, but it could be a, a, all, no, all manner of being yeah. in distress. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Eat the giant. Don't kill the messengers. You know, so um, uh, one of the things I was thinking about, speaking of the... Uh, um, I just lost my thought. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the what are conators? Um... Conators are, are okay. So the, you know, so the, you know what the root of the term minotaur is, right? No, I do not. Okay. I was hoping you would. I was hoping you would tell me. Well, it means the it means the uh, the bull of Minos, right? Minos, okay. The, okay. The king oh, I see. Of Crete in the in the in the myth, right? Gotcha. So so there's a similar construction, um, ah. but the conators are sort of like. Um, Oh, I don't want to give. <laughs> uh, you know, we are, don't have to. Yeah. Yes. They're you learn servants of, it, of the yeah. great. They're monstrous servants of the great bull who have been transformed by their service to it. Uh -huh. Whether they transform themselves or were transformed is up to the game master, right? I we see. have options where the horn giant, who is their sort of quasi god, is their prisoner, right? And you know, we have options where where he's not. So. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. Yeah, and this now, kind would of you... goes into something I was talking about with with some people online today, which is sort of how role playing games work, right? Because yeah. there's this discourse going on on uh, the service formerly known as Twitter. Um, <laughs> I usually call it X I T T E R, but it sounds <laughs> right. rude when I say it. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm going to say from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that. there's an argument right now that you know, I guess there was a there's a popular uh, streamer game person whoever you know. Uh, I'm an old man. I don't know who anybody is. Uh, and <laughs> uh, and they were saying, well, you know, I don't agree with the idea that you know D and D is just a fighting game right and there was a big discussion about this whether you know the preponderance of rules about fighting makes it a fighting game or what oh, right? yeah. and yeah. my response to this is that you know i think game designers a lot of the time we wish we could write in such a way that 
it you robotically play the game the way we want you to play it. One hundred percent. The same thing in the game dev. You know, for video games, if you know, a lot of folks like if they'd only play it the way I made it. But they that, only play it the way yeah. I made it, right? You know, and I think a lot of people see that as a goal because they have the idea that, well, you know, if the way to play it is very straightforward, then the game is less confusing and right. more inclusive because of that sort of direct instruction. And there's merit to that argument. And we've gotten some great games out of it, too. Right. I mean, this kind of argument was originally proposed back in the Forge community over 20 years ago. Right. And, yeah. you know, and some interesting games have come out of that. Right. However, I don't think that is the way people actually approach RPGs. I think they're sort of like you don't play them. You play with them. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. Yeah. Like, what is the ba- like one of the basic activities in playing an RPG is asking the GM if you can do this thing with that rule. Right. Right. So that is what, you know, in sort of middle brow circles we call you know interpreting or even deconstructing a text right yeah so we're having this yeah i have a this i went to university for this crap man so anyway (laughs) um (laughs) so basically you know when you open something like fantasy age right yeah uh, it's it's a matter of what you have in front of you and how you're going to use it and how you're going to interpret it and you may do it in a very different way than we do it, right? And this adventure kind of supports that approach. Yeah. And in Fantasy Age, we, and in Age games in general, we like to have that kind of, we like to present that kind of w- wiggle room to people. That's why right. Fantasy Age has peril and daring and fortune, right? And a lot of open-ended options. Um, for example, like I, working on the the, the monster book, um, there is a way to represent groups of opponents. Um, and But we also have a different way to represent groups of opponents in the Fantasy Age core um, that works, you know, that works well too. There it is. And, you know, you could conceivably even combine them, right? We leave the, we, we make the mechanics as intuitive as we can manage so that you can make those decisions on the fly. Right. And you can, and that helps you shape the emphasis of the game. Right. So, one of the examples is, for example, you know, one of the examples is, for example, ah, I'm really, uh, <laughs> I'm really living up to the, you know, fatigue degree I have. You're eating through your word count, sir. <laughs> I'm eating through my word count. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I would definitely delete. Um, <laughs> uh, where was I even? Uh, we were talking about, um, uh, sorry, I got I got sidetracked because there was there are people who were commenting. Uh, let me read them real f- going on. It's well, look, hold on real, real quick. Uh, uh, Rain says, uh, I think I saw some of this on Twitter. I think this is a good conversation to have. I hope that it <laughs> helps people realize why yeah. they play the games they play and have mm-hmm. a deeper appreciation for them. Okay. Uh, yeah, so- another another comment real quick. Uh, Bad Devil says, I think Matt Colville once proposed that an RPG is its community more than its rules. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, but at yeah. the same time, here's the thing, right? I mean, yeah. I think there's also a fallacy in thinking that, oh, well, if you take this to its furthest extent, then, you know, the rules don't matter. Right. And right. which is also, you know, a classic argument. Like the argument is basically is that if you are doing this interpretation, then you did it and the game didn't do it. Right. Which is but weird. And this feels a little it. nihilist or something, you know because what I mean? Like, everything, because you, you know, you're embed. everybody is embedded in a web of influences, right? Yeah. So if we provide a set of very strong influences and we provide a, a basic set of ideas to negotiate over, right? That counts, right? Yeah. Even if you don't use some of those ideas, even if you design against those ideas, like one, right. you know, in the history of RPGs, um, like over on Twitter, one thing I mentioned was Arduin. Um, and Arduin evolved from the fact that when Dungeons and Dragons got to the West Coast of the US, my friend Jesse Hainig, by the way, um, who is uh, one of the uh, fine folks working on Star Trek Online and is oh, just yeah. a- Fantastic 
uh, game guy, um, he he taught me this um, that you know D and D went to the West Coast. It was disconnected from the uh, Midwest war gamers that it had that had been playing it. So they started doing different things, right? Okay, yeah, yeah, and you know, and eventually that led to you know the Arduin supplements, right, and what Dave Hargrave did. Right. Which is of, you know, kind of a fork of Dungeons and Dragons. Right. So that is something where, you know, when somebody gets the book and they don't have the same set of assumptions, they can do some cool things that you don't expect with it. Right. You can also design against the book, which is something uh, I think is kind of the late. If you look at the history of RuneQuest. Right. So you have the late Steve Perrin. Um, discovering Dungeons and Dragons and also, um, you know, also being really into the society of creative anachronism, which is only a few years old at this point, right? So the folks in the SCA are making some discoveries about what it like, what it's like to wear armor and yeah. rock people with sticks, right? In the uh, sense of how they're how they're making it a game and what they have to account for, right? Well, yeah, over there, and so you know, uh, Steve Perrin comes up with the uh, Perrin conventions, right, which are a set of house rules for D and D, right? Ah. They're supposed to emphasize realism, and eventually that evolves into RuneQuest, which is kind of designing against the grain of D and D as heroic fantasy, right? For yeah. realistic fantasy based on a set of influences that that are around the designer, right? But, you know, there would be no rune quest without Dungeons and Dragons, right? Right. And there would right. be no, but specifically, there would be no rune quest the way it looks right now without Dungeons and Dragons. So, um, so I embrace that kind of playing with instead of playing the game. You play with I, the game. I agree with you. You know, and in part of it, I feel like, yes, you, that isn't to say that you get Lair of the Horn Giant and then suddenly you are just left with a bunch of pieces of something that you have to put together. There yeah. is, you know, there's a page to page, uh, you know, adventure here. Um, yeah, experience to have. Adventure. There are tables to generate uh, treasure on the fly, right? And we have yeah. guidance for using it all in the adventure. Right. That's exactly right. We walk you through it with very clear language, and it's uh, and it's enjoyable that way. That's yeah. not not a bad way, but it's yeah. also constructed to be module with some pieces that you can borrow and and sub yeah. out and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah so i guess you know what's interesting for me when you have these conversations is there a supposition that one over the other is the more valid expression of the game um well i mean here's the thing i can write a game make a game that has you know artistic goals creative goals right it's like any other creative effort right there is a message to it yeah. Um, certainly, I think Will is saying something, you know, about about mythic resonance and the way it can persist through time with this adventure, yeah. right? So I would say, you know, the wrong interpretations would probably be the ones that dismiss that, right? And Fair you know, still, if you have fun with it um, and you just make this all, you know, all trivial set of encounters, like, sure, go for it. But yeah. I think you'll have a much richer experience if you approach approach it uh, in the way that, you know, like I just said. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I hear you. I hear you. And and, and I think with, with respect to the creator of the, you know, the intentions of the creator, I think are important, you know, uh, important element to this. But it's also, it's all about having fun. Yeah. It is, you know, it is about sort of getting, sitting around with people and communing and, and enjoying space together, you know, wow. and, and taking a trip. I mean, like that's. I think, I think enjoyment sometimes more than fun, right? Sure. Because, okay. You know, uh, um, yeah, tell me the difference. <laughs> well, enjoyment is that you find that you've had a fulfilling experience, um, but it doesn't mean you necessarily feel happy at the end, right? Oh, okay. Well, so. Uh, and, All right, I, I want to unpack that real quick because I yeah. feel like joy being, you know, I have an example you know. of it, but I can't tell it to you because of because of a because there's there's a content warning. <laughs> I see. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair um, enough. Yeah, and and you know, I but, do want to say, 
Malcolm, uh, yeah. um, one of the things that I'm looking forward to, you know, we've got, we're, we're crafting a little corner of the community, mm-hmm. kind of cutting it out and, and uh, shaping it right now. And it's called the Atomic Think Tank. Yes. In that space, we are going to do all kinds of stuff. We're already doing lots of stuff, but we are, uh, we're going to be having talks and engagements. And, and uh, one of the things, you know, I've always been after you to, to pop on and, have a moment with Malcolm, um, you know, a professorial kind of discussion and, uh, you know, uh, philosophical uh, enlightenment and, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, sounds like I'm building a cult for you. But, um, you know, I, I, I know that we've got some plans or ideas for that. What um, if you were to pick like three overarching topics about TTRPG development or really whatever you want that you think is uh, a, a kind of uh, uh, related to this? What would those topics be? Not not committing you to oh. something, but I just want to know what you would speak oh. to, you know. Now, there's a heck of a question. Um, yeah. Oh, I think Playcraft is a big one because okay. we hear a lot about how to be a good game master, but we don't hear much about how to be a good player. Truth. Right? And it's not like I want to go, well, you know, it's your fault, you chaotic bastards but (laughs) sometimes it's true no uh well sometimes but you know a lot of the time there's going to be you know there are skills you could have to develop as a player to be absolutely contributes to the table and the first is to realize that you're not coming in like a customer right Uh, Uh, i see you're coming in like a customer to you know buy our fine commercial wares but yeah once you play it right you don't go all right gm entertain me right and i know the rise of paid game mastering has kind of made this fuzzy and maybe it's not true for paid game mastering but um but as a player you have to go in and bring it you have to perform right you have to perform for the you have to perform for the uh, in a way that is meaningful for other people and not just yourself and i think there are a lot of players out there who don't know that they're being difficult yeah. because they don't know that they're supposed to contribute, right? Agreed, agreed. And, yeah, you know, the nature, the thing, nature, yeah. Yeah, there's a thing going around called like the Mercer effect, right? About how like, you know, everybody expects, you know, DMs to be like Matt Mercer and blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, is it's not Matt Mercer being a great DM. It's the fact that he has a bunch of voice actors who have who have a motivation to play well. Yeah. So right, you know, but I'll also say so my this, first though. tip is is you know maybe slip each of your players a fiver. And then... <laughs> no, there, there is definitely that, more. Yeah, there's definitely more. There's more of a risk that they are, they are, uh, it's a higher proposition, uh, to, to get paid as much and, and, and oh, yeah, to be as popular. Risk. There's definitely risk. But there's also, because but the, there's also a relationship. Folks. There's also a relationship. You can see yeah. that. Yes. You know, there's, there's, there's an understanding. Yeah. Yes. Like, you know, you should play with people that you can see yourself, I think, going to having a, having dinner with. Yeah. Sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, being able to talk on guard and yeah. necessarily, but you know, you should be able to go have dinner with that person sometime and it not be torture. But, <laughs> Mark Karen says that's why I play solo. <laughs> <laughs> so, play, but you know, but there's but there's the craft of play, and the craft of play, you know, it can draw from improv, right? Um, you know, so for example, in improv we have an idea called blocking, right? And that's when somebody says a thing and then you cut it off, right? And most most of the time that just stops the energy of a scene, right? But you see it frequently in role-playing games, right? Um, I think the other one would be, okay, so that's one. The second one would probably be about their relationship between games and fiction. Um, Okay. Because games are, because I think in traditional games, there's at least there's an idea. I think people have an idea that they're, that fiction, that a game should just generate fiction as if it appears in a book. But all of the, you know, but the narratives in our lives, right? 
like not what's happening to us, right, are things that we construct post hoc. We tell a story about ourselves and what we're doing, right? And so we're not telling the story at the time, right? So I think people misunderstand this. So because they want like an arc where they fight a big evil bad guy and blah, 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 blah. But the fact of the matter is that they are experiencing stuff in character, right? And the story about beating the bad guy is something that they, you know, it's something that their memories form post hoc. And it is the, and I think it's the beauty of role playing games in that you have these experiences, right? You have these very sentimental experiences and, um, right. And those are the things that you turn into stories. Now, you can do it another way. And there are many games that call themselves narrative games to emphasize that, that do this, right? And there are whole new structures of play, right? Um, yeah. That can support it. Lots of stuff out there. But I think you have to appreciate the fact that you have these experiences, right? And that's what creates the story. So that there's that relationship. And there's also questions of genre and what genre should mean and so on and so forth. So that's that would be number two. So play scale, uh, fiction versus RPGs and something else. I don't know. Yeah. Something uh, else. <laughs> audience choice. Yeah. Yeah. You know, actually that's a very interesting question. I would be curious from folks who are uh, listening right now, tell us what you would, what would you like to hear Malcolm talk about as it relates to the stuff? I mean, I think that's uh, I feel like we're having some problems on Facebook, but it's just a, uh, okay, good. Do cut your download link. Nice. Oh, you know, um, I guess we could do, I can do something sword related too, I guess. Yes. I just <laughs> found a new word for sword, uh, swords person, uh, spadassin. Spadassin? Spadassin, like assassin, but with spad on the front of it. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, that comes from spadone, right? Oh, so what's that? that makes sense. Oh, it's a giant sword. Like it's the kind of thing uh, that people call that gamers call great sword or, zvi, or zvihandas, right? Um, yeah. But usually, when we're practicing with, we call them montantes or spadones. I actually don't know how to use one, but uh, one of my <laughs> students, one of my students does. Um, Got you. So yeah. every once in a while, we play this great game because those. Okay, I'm just going to talk about swords now and waste your time. Yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, so, Jason Sunday says swords of the they, shadow planet. <laughs> oh, swords of the shadow planet. Well, there's a thing. There's, there's something I'll tell you. Nice segue. Time. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> but uh, No, the exercise you do with a Spadone is because it was designed as a bodyguard weapon and sort of a space clearing device. It's generally okay. going to be a two or three on one thing where one person has the giant sword and you have smaller swords. And you think you're going to get oh. them. And then you don't because you try <laughs> okay. to parry it. And it turns out you can't parry a giant sword moving at high speed. Got you, so, got you. I'm I'm presuming that there's some different moves and and yeah, approaches yeah, yeah, to the yeah, but, yeah, yeah. The funny thing though is that like I am hardly the only person who works in the industry who's a sword guy, right? So uh, um, no, you're the you're the there you're the only one. I checked. No, 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 no. I, no, I, I just checked the record. I will you know shout out to um to past uh, Pathfinder um freelancer um Craig Shackleton. He runs okay. the. Uh, he runs the Ottawa School of Swordplay, right? And oh, I got nice. my, my start in uh, in German longsword with him. Uh, he's great. I think um, one of... Oh, what is the name of... Not Mike Pondsmith, but the other male Pondsmith. Anyone? The other male Pondsmith. Yes. I think he's, I think he's a sword guy too, but I'm not sure. Um, is it uh, like the the cyberpunk pawnsmith? The cyberpunk pawnsmith, but I'm thinking of the other pawnsmith in oh. the family, who is a dude. I assume, uh, I think he's a dude, and who develops the Witcher. Anyway. Oh, got you. Uh, yeah. Man, I you sure used up a whole bunch of time figuring out who's uh, who likes swords. Oh, we'll industry. we'll edit it in post to die <laughs> Um, um, so yeah, I guess I could do that. Like, or I could just talk about like, actually the, what, yeah, there's, there are a lot of interesting Cody, ideas. Cody Pondsmith. There we go. Yeah. Who, which Cody, Cody. Pondsmith. Cody. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, there are a lot of questions actually about like what fighting is and what role it should serve. That might be an interesting topic because, um, you know, the way we do combat in role playing games comes from wargaming, right? It comes from wargaming that's meant to have one figure represent multiple soldiers, right? So you have a figure on the sand table and it's 10 guys and, uh, right. And so that unit based combat, right. <laughs> combined with a system of gradually reducing, um, you know, gradually knocking hit points or health or whatever down. The hit points health thing, hit points or health as we do it in age games, uh, that comes from uh, naval miniatures rules from like the 60s or 70s that Dave Arneson found. Okay. And, uh, or I think it's the 60s. And so, you know, but the thing is, if we look at, you know, real fights they're chaotic they're all over the place right? yeah yeah and also you know when we think about hand-to-hand -hand combat right we think of it as you know you make an attack and again we think you make an attack roll and you hit the person right except in a real fight you know i'm gonna have maybe i'm gonna be grabbing somebody's head yeah and, you know, uh maybe i'm gonna be on the ground like right um maybe I'm it gonna really be distracted. is and it's an so, exhausted, like when you see actual people trying to fight in the way that people fought, it yeah. is, it looks like just a very slow motion, exhausted, you know. Oh, when they're fighting a, in armor? Oh, yes. It's a heck of a thing. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? Is that fighting, yeah, fighting in armor is very weird and it's not the way people think it looks, right? No, um, yeah, it's not, it's certainly less regal and less, you know, sort of, uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah, not to mention that it's also, much more intimate than than you imagine it to be like well yes, running a because, sword through somebody is because yeah. the thing is is that you can't like here's the thing about armor it's really good right in role playing games we have to make armor weaker because otherwise right. you'd just be really frustrated all the time because <laughs> yeah. once you've got a suit of armor on your options are either nothing happens or you are um just taken out of combat immediately because right. the force needed to <laughs> deal with you is usually enough to hurt you pretty badly, right? Right. Like, um, you know, a medieval, a late medieval dagger is a 14 inch spike. And the idea is I look for a place between the plates and I, and I stick it in, right? Right, right. Um, right. So it's very different, right? And you even like hold the, you know, middle of your sword and pull, kind of hold it like a spear to find those spots. So it's very different from make an attack roll, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. and a lot like a lot more like a WWE wrestling than it is. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All wrestlers. Oh man, two types of pro wrestlers: the ones, the ones who can't wrestle, and the ones who can wrestle, who are extremely scary. I don't know. Being Canadian. Yes. Uh, one is one becomes familiar with the hearts. If anybody's familiar with the hearts, I'm not a big wrestling guy, but I do know about the hearts and the hearts house where they would train uh, family members and relatives. And I saw a documentary and I have never seen people go into quite that much pain voluntarily. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh, no, except for the thing where you put a sheet of insects with really bad stings on you. It's a sheet a, of insects? Practice. Isn't there that? Oh, oh bullet ants. Bullet bullet, ants. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there was a, an ancient. Uh, um, uh, no, it's like what you... contemporary, I think. I think it is. I think it's a traditional cultural practice somewhere. Oh, okay. I'm not going right. to talk about it anymore. Or otherwise, I'll seem like some kind of idiot but uh well no um then no, again i'm always I'm scared for, i'm i'm that's my job now. sir i'm i'm very scared of bug bites um yeah no i i am not a fan of bug bites but um yeah. i'm also the idea of uh of putting a bunch of uh you know uh biting bugs on your body in some yeah. fashion as a as a you know that's... the first hundred or so you might <laughs> it wouldn't make any difference after that yeah that's probably true yeah, yeah. you know you can get used to a lot of you know things um, so let me see this real games, quick. Folks. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, but this all is very informative of the whole th- thing. And I like that uh, Nicole says, this is why there are those hated encumbrance rules as it relates to how uh, arduous actual, you know, battle and oh, armor can be. There was um, a, yeah, yes, actually. Here's the thing, like you can, like, I know if you have well-fitted armor, you can do all kinds of things in it, right? Like, um, like one of my students has, uh, has his own armor uh, and he can do cartwheels in it all kinds of things. Right. But it is still, you know, it's still very tiring and you're not going to move that fast. And also you will make the mistake of leaving your helmet out in the sun exactly once in my experience. Oh, oh, you then you put it on and it's like a big. Yes. And it's a furnace. It's a furnace. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like a, yeah. Put your head in a, in a hot pot. Yeah. Put your head in a hot pot. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of things I want to cover here real quick. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Rain says, uh, as somebody who has uh, experience with a lot of other RPGs, I would be fascinated to hear Malcolm's take on what other RPGs could bring to age. What other RPGs could bring to age? That's an interesting one. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is I'm going to have a discussion with someone who um, who runs age solo with some tools from other games very soon. Mm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and, you know, I will have some answers for you. In terms of, like, <clears throat> I know some people like using advantage, disadvantage. Yeah. From D&D in it. Um, you know, I talked to someone, the fellow who runs the rando stream. Um, yes. I made Paul. an appearance. That was Paul. Paul. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, first of all, I was super impressed with everything he'd set up for Cthulhu Awakens. I, it took me five oh, minutes yeah. to make the character. It was it was fantastic, right? Um, but yeah, he he uses that, right? And that's an example of a decent mechanic. It's something that I might, you know, make some AG variations for. Like maybe advantage applies to the stunt die, or maybe we can have advantage without um, without necessarily having to roll again. Like one way you might do it is take the two highest, uh, you know, take the highest die and double it and replace okay. another die, right? So if I roll, let's say, um, a five, a four, and a three, right? I can say, oh, no, I have two, you know, I have two fives and a four now, right? And that would represent an advantage. And for disadvantage, what I might do is like, yes, you, t- you have to replace one of your dice with the lowest dice double you know, again, right? Sure. So I can, you know, so if I have advantage on that five, four, three roll, right, it would become a 14, right? Because it's two fives and a four. If I had disadvantage on that roll, then it would be uh, 11, I think, because it would be two threes and a five. Okay. Right. So that's one way we can apply the idea of advantage from D and D to age, but in an age kind of way. I like Did you it. Folks like that, I just made it up. You know, and that's why we love it um, <laughs> um, because extemporaneously, you know, you you uh, uh, work uh, very well. Um, I want to real quick. I want to just to remind folks that um, you can check out oh the rando stream. I've dropped a link in chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it should be populating now but uh, go check those guys out they're really great mm-hmm. um let's see uh reading some of this stuff oh, and um, aspects from fate like yeah uh, i have mixed feelings about the rest of fate but aspects are just fire right because yeah. they're a trait that you can swing three different ways and i have often thought of having some version of that but whenever i get to it it always ends up being easier to split the functions of an aspect from fate up into uh into different things like i was thinking of doing something like that for cthulhu awakens with bonds yeah. or you could have a variable bond but i eventually just went with personal and external bonds because those were the two functions i really wanted and uh and it was easier to to separate them i could do more interesting stuff with them that way yeah. Um, so uh, real quick, I want to I want to jump to Vaughn. Vaughn has been uh, um, 
positing some very um, uh, uh, interesting questions and, and, and stuff. So I want to at least get one of them before we're, we're done. Uh, and let's see. Vaughn says, I think Pendragon kind of captures it with the damage rolls of knightly weapons versus anything else in the PC. Oh, yeah. Points. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that is that, you know, there's there's some great stuff where, you know, you think and like we have a tendency to think in terms of, well, you know, surely a big sword would do more damage than a little sword. But really, you know, it depends on our design and play objectives. Right. Yeah. So yeah. That's something that's in, we talk about about that in the modern age mastery guide. Like we have a bunch of way different ways to do task resolution. And one of them is that, you know, we don't think about how realistic something is when we set target numbers instead. All right. This is a section that, that Jack wrote, actually. Uh, instead, you think about how, you know, what the dramatic role of the task is. Right. Right. So we can play with that kind of thing a lot. Um, yeah. Oh, Pendragon has those uh, personality trait mechanics, too, that are just fantastic. Oh, nice. Pendragon's a great game, by the way. You should... Go get Pendragon. Absolutely. Okay. So here, listen. Um, we After are, Lair of the Horn Giant. At, well, yeah. Get get Lair of the Horn Giant. Now, here's the thing. On screen, I've got a QR code, and uh, right now you're looking at the Drive Through RPG one, and we also have the Roll Twenty QR code, and the Green Ronin on Lint Store. And so you pick your, you know, your your location of choice. Uh, Hold your phone up to it, click on that link, and as if by magic, you will be transported to a place where we can get your money. And, uh, yeah, you know, buy uh, buy four or five. Uh, buy one for a friend. Buy some for your family. Christmas is just around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, no, no. Get get the bigger ticket items, such as... Oh, I'm so... Hold on. I'm, I'm so happy this showed up. <laughs> Let me... Oh... Hey, Last that's week, right. I finally got a copy of Mine's on the way Awakens. too. I'm looking forward to currently, it. Currently, you know, currently being shipped, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you head on over to the Kickstarter, I do think there is a link to uh I'm to grabbing it right it. now. Yeah. yeah. And uh yeah, so it's uh it's not I don't believe it's too late. I want to let me double check. Um Late pledges can be given. Oops, uh, one sec. I'm making sure that I'm not lying. But currently, yeah. So we've got a button. We got a big old button on the on the uh, site. Late pledge pre order here, and yeah. I'll drop that in chat for you. So head on over, do that. So currently, uh, it's going to backers, and it's going into um, our <laughs> shipping channels. And that's right. Uh, yeah. Of course, it's going to go out to backers first, and that's going to going to get. That's mad. happening right now. Yeah, and that's happening right now, though. Um, so, yeah, and I am super happy with how it turned out. It is quite good looking, and it's really nice. Yeah, and I kind of got a, I kind of got a, got to. Uh, I have to admit that I didn't want it to be green because I didn't want it to be a stereotypical Cthulhu color, but right. I was wrong. Yeah, it looks great. <laughs> So yeah, no, it looks really, really good. Yeah, um, it's it's quite pretty. And hey, so uh, in the in the waiting room, great job on it. Everyone did a great job on it. The content is top shelf. It is so great. I'm really looking forward to it. And I, I have, I'm debating. So I'm I'm starting to uh, step into the world of GMing, and I'm starting to look and I'm trying to think of which age game do I want to do? And I think it's Cthulhu Awakens. I really do. I think it... Well, I'm quite flattered by that, Troy. Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's absolutely fantastic. And I'm looking forward to that. And, you know, we're talking about some future sort of um, mm -hmm. series of, you know, talking about like, you know, learning to GM kind of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, hey, that'll be hey, a super fun... are you on a regular stream related to Cthulhu Awakens? I am. That's... Or semi-regular? Uh, uh, you know, that would be the one that Ian runs. Um, yes. And yeah, yeah. Now, he... to, now to the developer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now the developer. Yeah. And he, uh, he did, he tried his level best to, uh, to, you know, uh, to kill us, uh, Ben, and he failed. So, <laughs> you know, I think he might want to take another swipe. Um, but I want also want to talk real quick about the atomic think tank. Now, this is the thing about this whole thing that I love. Um, it is a, it's a community platform. We're using mighty networks. And the reason we chose mighty networks is because of the there's a vibe of like um, uh, some some classes to kind of uh, that you can take or you can run, uh, and we you know I feel like the TTRPG space 
is, you know, there are opportunities to learn by exposure. There, there's the trial by fire, which I think is how most of us learn to how to play. But then there, I think there are opportunities for us to, and opportunities for a community to run, um, uh, you know, their own courses and sort of share the best practices and those sorts of things. And then also, I think, you know, run a course on teaching people how to, you know, disregard all the rules and do your own thing, which I love. Um, and so uh, there's that. But the other thing about the uh, Mighty Networks is that it's going to be a space where you'll be able to, uh, one of the things, one of the challenges that we've got in our modern era is that there are 50,000 different platforms where people are having conversation. And we want to be in all those places, but that's a full-time job in itself. And so we're trying to pull some of the conversation in and some, and let people know that there's a space where Malcolm will be in to hang out and we can all sit down and chat and then preserve that conversation in a space meant for it. Um, and so that's really something I think that we can look forward to with uh, the uh, Atomic Think Tank. And we've got some... I, you know, I don't know how to share this. I, well, we, we have some fun things being planned. Um, one particular one that I'm thinking of, Malcolm, um, that we really haven't, I think we might've said the name, but that's it. What? The thing starting with an E? Yes. Oh. Yeah. We haven't really gotten into, we can, into we can what start, it is. We can say it. You think so? Yeah. Well, we want people to, to go to the thing about the thing. Yeah, but we don't, I think we want to, well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know what? Here's the thing. I, I, I am, like I said, I'm a bit of a- to say the thing is your responsibility. Well, no, I'm, I'm more of a media sadist. Like I want to, you know, sort of uh, edge everybody to the point where we get, you know, to the event and it's fun and, you know, all that stuff. But I, I think I will defer to you. I mean, this, you've been, you've been right. working on a great project. So I want to- yes. yes, we're doing an age magazine. <gasps> nice. Yes, it's going to be, um, you know, electronic release, um, and it is called Engine Magazine, and it has support for the age system in general. Uh, we have articles that are going to be, you know, linked to various games, but uh, we also talk about how to apply what's in them to different games, right? So, um, yeah, there's a nice assortment of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in issue one and uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna be yeah we're gonna be hosting a big launch party uh, digital uh, online in the atomic think tank and we're inviting you to come and be a part of it it'll be a lot of fun so more information on that to come um, Nicole says next week and I'm like whoa um, uh, soon at the very least um, oh, we, we def definitely good idea to mention it then eh? Uh, yeah, we'll, 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 uh, we'll talk about timing and all of that, but it's going to happen at the atomic think tank. And, uh, you know, if you want to be on the ground floor, you want to be there kind of, uh, helping us build a little bit, helping us, uh, understand sort of what it is that you'd like to see and also what it is that you'll bring to this community experience. You can do that by clicking on the link that I'll share here. And it's the invite to the atomic think tank. Um, these invites are the way that they work is, um, some of them will expire. And so this is a private community just for now. We're just building things up just so we can kind of put all the pieces in play. But pretty soon we'll just be fully public so you can access most, if not all of it. And uh, and we'll do that with a launch party for Engine. Yeah. I think that's it, friend. Um, Malcolm, okay. talk to me about uh, where, where can people find you if they want to chat, where if they want to get into this, you know, these esoteric conversations about the nature of being and TTRPGs, <laughs> where um, can they go? You can get a hold of me on Grad. Yeah. Um, that is that is the Green Running uh, fan Discord. Yep. And it is a very fine place to be. As well. It is indeed. All right. So they can uh, find you. And you who are you on there? You're Malcolm? I am. Yeah, I'm Malcolm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, easy to find. I'm easy to find if you post something in an age channel, I will definitely find it because I follow age channels regularly. You do indeed. You do indeed. And then so is there anything in particular that uh, folks should uh, uh, when they when they shine the Malcolm signal into the sky? Um, you know, what should they what should they do to really tweak your being, make you mad or get you get you activated? Oh, I don't. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, anything about threefold. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about. Because, nice. Okay. 
it was one of those great projects that unfortunately the pandemic was not very kind to. Yeah, you know, and and I'm yeah, I'm looking forward to to shining a brighter light on mm-hmm. on it because I think it's such a great it's so great. Yes. And you can ask about Swords of the Shadow Planet and I will be evasive. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will like tell it. you that there are giant carts pulled by dinosaurs. Giant yeah. carts pulled by dinosaurs, you say? Yeah, like town-sized carts, like mobile towns pulled by dinosaurs. Oh, mobile towns. Okay, I got you. Yes. All right, interesting. That's because of the extremely uh, variable nature of the landscape, because things tend to change around over on the I shadow see. planet. Right, so um, there's very a nice. Hey, real quick. fact that hey, you real know, quick, I want to tell we'll something more. Nice. Okay. Uh, Duke, if you'd like, you can drop an invite link to the grad discussion. I just gave you the power. Um, and then, uh, so folks are asking, there's a couple questions, and then we'll we'll call it for the day. Uh, mm-hmm. If a person, uh, more dungeons, uh, take my money, says Steve. Which Steve? A Steve, S-E-V-E. Oh, um, S-E-V-E. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, per- I'm, I'm hoping it's Steve. Seeing. Maybe Sev. <laughs> Stevie. Okay. Um, but, you know, uh, d- d- looking into the future, we know more will come. Uh, is uh, Are we looking far into the future, you think? Or is it closer than we think? Or um, Closer than you think. For nice. I like the, that. For the Trojan War side, for one of the Trojan War size things, at least. It's going to be okay. closer than you think. Uh, other one, you know, it might be, you know, A little, it might yeah. be on the sooner side as well. Uh, okay. For some of the bigger things, um, you know, we are looking a little further down the line. And as basically, you know, the way things work at, you know, a small game company is that when we have to deal with one thing, everything else has to change. um, That's right. Yeah. Some of the time. So, um, you know, so we're, we're kind of shuffling our priorities around, but I am grinding through on a bunch of stuff and I'm really going to be happy to share it with you. Fantastic. Uh, and that includes the next issue of Engine, which I'm already collecting articles for. Oh, I love and, it. And, um, you know, more Fantasy Age stuff, um, a couple of larger releases. And I have one project that I have been outlining and re-outlining for a few years, and we'll see if I get around to it. Um, Great. But there's there, is, there is a question on the floor about um, any more blogs uh, on uh, Swords of the Shadow Planet. On Sword of the Shadow Planet, basically, once we can talk about what it is, we'll really start talking about what it is. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right? Great. Because the state it's in right now is that I have all of the writing in, and I am about three quarters of the way through um, finalizing it all before I send it to an editor. However. Mm. I'm the I'm the fantasy age developer now, and I need to put in some time on fantasy age. Absolutely understandable. So yeah. it's probably going to be like a three one ratio of efforts yes. for that, right? Where it's three weeks of fantasy age and one week of of uh, SSP. Well, and, one thing uh, I know. I was just going to say one thing I know about Malcolm Shepard is that you are tirelessly committed to getting stuff out the door, and I appreciate it and love it. And uh, oh, I would that say is, tirelessly. Uh, you are quite tired. Yes, uh, <laughs> I see that. Yeah. I keep looking at your under your uh, in the title area. It says developer fatigue degree winded, and I keep thinking that says fatigue wizard. So you know maybe that's well, a thing. maybe that's. Maybe that's an even better title. <laughs> the Fatigue Wizard. I like it. Uh, listen, wizard. chat, thank you so much for hanging out. You know, we all love it when Malcolm comes and and uh, regales us and educates us and shares, you know, uh, a good stuff about the Adventure Game Engine games. And uh, really head on over to the Atomic Think Tank because you're going to want to find a seat because we'll, uh, we'll have Malcolm out there doing some stuff and sharing some. Uh, Malcolm, thank you very much for hanging out with us. This has been, as per usual, a great conversation. And don't forget to go pick up Lair of the Horned Giant. All you have to do is click on that, uh, take a picture of that QR code, and you will get there immediately. Links are in chat. Um, uh, I think with that, I say, oh, don't forget to come hang out with us on Monday. We've got, it's the first show 
that of the planning session that we did last week. So what we do, we invite the community and we plan out a bunch of topics directly with them and we do it live, which is a lot of fun. And we end up with three months and some change of great topics. And so next week's the first one. Stay tuned for that. Oh, we, we should yes. do that here. We have done it once before, but I think we should do it again. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. Um, yeah, Mumamaro approaches. Uh, so with that, I say have a great rest of your week. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you on Monday. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.